Okay, today we're going to be discussing the genre of science fiction and mainly focusing on the relationship between audience and film within that genre. So when I say the relationship between audience and film for science fiction, what immediately comes to mind? Nerds like Trekkies and Warsians, like those on um, Big Bang Theory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I figured he'd say something like that because the stereotypical fan that a lot of people think of when it comes to science fiction is this like 40 year old man with greasy hair in his mum's basement or something and there was even a whole South Park episode where there was a character who is exactly that, he's the embodiment of the stereotypical science fiction fan. But obviously not all science fiction fans are 40 year old men. I know a number of people who are my age, teenagers, women as well, who are fans of science fiction films. Even well, some of them are being more aimed towards children, such as like Men in Black. I wouldn't say that's aimed at children, but maybe Star Wars. It's PG. Star Wars, I'd say, is more aimed at children as well, as well as old men, because, well, older people. Um, because there's a whole Lego Star Wars thing in itself um, with Lego toys and lunchboxes for kids. And I don't really think the Lego Star Wars is aimed at older people. I think it's aimed at younger people. But, of course, any Star Wars fan... The paraphernalia. Like well, a lot of men have this wall to see from ceiling to floor in their bedrooms who are massive cult, cult sort of uh, followers. But obviously, like you said, it is also aimed at children. But I don't know any children that can afford to get the Lego uh, Millennium Falcon, which is over £100 just to buy. Yeah. Um, when you said cult, that actually, in my head, it made me immediately think a lot of fandoms in general, not even just science fiction, are kind of... They have this negative representation to kind of be called like a cult. Um, and if you think within the science fiction genre with Star Wars, um, there is even this like kind of cult-like religion called Jediism, where a lot of um, um, which started back in two thousand and one, or rather, it gained a lot of public attention back in two thousand and one, when over seventy thousand Australians and over twenty thousand Canadians actually recorded their religion as Jedi, and. Um, there's even an Ameri uh, a documentary called American Jedi, and it follows some people who are aspiring to be real life Jedi's. So there are obviously there are some fans that take it a bit to extreme lengths, but I feel like the reason science fiction in general brings so many, I feel like it has such a large audience compared to a lot of genres. Like I I don't know anybody who would say their favourite genre is like I don't know rom-coms yeah I, mm, yeah not many people go for rom-coms there feel are like, a few there are a few I feel like it's more passive audiences who would go for rom-coms romances and comedies because they just take it all in but I feel like when it comes to an active audience so they're like you know taking part in the community of like fans and um coming up with theories about films I feel like science fiction is one of like the biggest genres for that mm. and I feel like it it's because it's so different to other genres like all genres are based on like realistic things like romance you you'll find that in your everyday life maybe uh comedy I... people tell jokes but with science fiction mm -hmm. there's this it's almost something that's way out of our reach and isn't reality and or at least it has the potential to be a reality in the far future, and that's why it brings a huge audience, because people are so drawn to the mystery and want to see it become a reality. Um, and like Avatar, a planet from far, far away. You know, people do like to think that there is life on other planets. The mysteries of having other planets to go to, it's just, your imagination can run wild with you. And I think in Avatar, in mm -hmm. particular, the tremendous amount of work and puppetry and all sorts that went into that to bring that whole other planet to life. I feel like also with Avatar, people are so drawn to it because 
climate change is a big issue in our world in real life and people are saying there's no planet b there's no other planet to go to this is our only planet and we need to save it but the idea of there being another planet that we could potentially live on is well, that's what science fiction brings to life isn't it the space stations the other planets mm-hmm. and getting away from earth basically yeah and with avatar as well not only is it a big thing because you know our planet's going to die soon so we need to start looking for another one not that there probably is one that we could live on but also um well if you look at things like the running man is it the run no it's not the running man just arnold schwarzenegger did a film about living on mars right yeah no i I do remember that yeah do you remember that one Yeah. yeah i can't remember what it's called though total recall yeah that's it total recall and that was, that's like one of the beginnings. You think that might have been a trend starter for trend st- Life on Earth and films? I mean, not Life well, on Earth, I think but Life on Earth. I planets. think it came from the TV series, but that's one of the main beginning films that I remember that meant going to live on another planet. Going back to Avatar. Sorry. Um, yeah. I also, another thing that, well, another thing that draws me to it personally is number one, the climate change situation, Um, but also it's kind of a metaphor for uh, something that's happened in the past when we um, found America and, like, overtook it. Think of of Pocahontas versus Avatar and think about the stories and how similar they are where there's these uh, people uh, (laughs) who visit a new land, uh, Mm -hmm. which is America. Yeah, the invaders. And... They want it for, I think in Pocahontas they're like digging for gold. Gold, yeah. But in Avatar they're... They're after basically another metal, precious metal. Yeah, that's where they uh, take down the big main tree of life or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's it's the same story, like we are invading other people's land and trying to make it our own. But But if you think of Pocahontas and her and the Indians, they were very much about the land and about how important the land was to them. A bit like the Aborigines in Avatar. Yeah, when they like speak the ri- to the tree and Pocahontas yeah, herself speaks yeah. to the tree. Yeah, exactly. Well, they're all about the land and then these invaders come in and they basically just tear it all up for their own wealth. Yeah. Um, they're all about the land and then these invaders come in and they basically just tear it all up for their own wealth. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there are said to be more Avatar films coming out and they're going to be filmed in 3D. I think there's like four more coming out. So do you wow. think do you think 3D would be best for Avatar or not? Or like just any science fiction film in general, like think about, I don't know, like spaceships like coming through the screen in 3D or would it be better just 2D? Do you know, I've actually seen a couple of the films in 3D. Um, and to me, it just gave me a headache. <laughs> I mean, that's your own personal... Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, if I go all the way back to my very first 3D film, which was Captain EO over in Disney, that was fantastical. The, if you do it right and have the things come flying out in front of you, maybe make it a bit more 4D in some areas, makes it more fun for the audience, doesn't it? Yeah. So for science fiction in particular what do you feel like are the best conditions to watch the film in would you say cinema with big screen or just like on your phone on a tv on an airplane or like with people or on your own what what do you think that's a good question because i think every film is different i do like to see them in the cinema i do admit that and that science fiction is like a really broad genre. There's so it many is. things that come into it. It's yeah, not just I mean, aliens and spaceships. There's so much more. Like even Jurassic Park Jurassic, is counted. Well, there you go. Jurassic film. Park. I went to see that three times at the cinema because it was such a fantastical mm-hmm. revolution in the technology yeah. from films we'd never seen like that before. Yeah. So you know that was a fantastical, and to be honest, the only one that I can compare to that since is really Avatar Mm -hmm. with the process of the technology getting better Um, I think Avatar I went to see a couple of times at cinema it depends on the film I mean like The Martian I didn't go to see that 
on the cinema, but I've seen it since. And I wouldn't have liked to have gone to the cinema to watch it. I mean, it's you. It's really about your taste in films. I mean, some people, they might want to see films like Jurassic Park in cinema because they're interested in mm. dinosaurs and that comes into science fiction because it's something that isn't real now, but, you know, it's, it's potential mm. that it could happen. Well, Passenger, um, it was about two people being very alone on the space station looking after everybody. The man was alone for a lot longer than him and the woman were alone. But they couldn't get back into going back to sleep with everybody else and everything. So it was a bit, what's it, you know, but I, I don't think I could have seen that at the cinema because, you know, I'm quite an emotional person and I would have cried a couple of times and you don't want that emotional blab. Well, for me, I, I, f I feel like with science fiction, I would prefer to watch it alone. So I don't mm -hmm. think cinema would be a great setting for me to watch um, science fiction films because I just like to... For science fiction in particular, like there's so many underlying meanings in many of the films. Not always, but usually there is. Like take ET, it can. Some people think it's about immigration, uh, because you remember the scene where they had to dress ET up to hide his identity that he's an alien. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like to think about theories by myself, and when mm. I'm with people, if they're just spitting out, "Oh my god, I think this is going to happen," I'm just like, I wanted to find that out for myself, or figure it out for myself. But I think with, I think be, seeing it on a big screen is just so much better because you get to take in everything that you can't take in in just on your TV in real life because it's just not as fascinating. Mm. I remember seeing Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom, and Jurassic World in in cinema, and. It was just so amazing to see on a big screen, really. like it, yeah, everything yeah. was so much bigger and so detailed. And then seeing it on the TV, it's still amazing, but it's not as great and fascinating as it was at it, the cinema. Yeah, I think also um, for a lot of people who are fans of particular genres like science fiction, they can go to like conventions and that's where they'll find their own sense of community because at the cinema you're not always going to find just science fiction fans there's going to be people who are trying out new genres like there's going to be kids there's going to be elder people there's not going to be people with your exact interests but if you mm -hmm. go to a convention you bought tickets specifically to go to and you're gonna you're more likely to find people that are more like you like comic con and mm -hmm. the trekkie conventions and stuff yeah um so if you like Especially with science fiction, because it's, I feel like it's kind of looked down upon because of the stereotypical fans. In, in some of these places as well, you can meet the famous people, mm -hmm. and meet your heroes from the films or the TV series that you have really enjoyed. And yeah. most of these are science fiction. Yeah, I, I, it is such a big uh, popular genre, but I feel like it's also looked down upon because mm -hmm. of the stereotypical fans. But you know, it's, I feel like this community is probably the best because they're so like accepting towards each other because they know they're looked down upon, I guess. Mm -hmm. Even though it's like one of the most popular genres, I feel like. Um, okay, um, we kind of briefly, you kind of briefly mentioned this a bit earlier, saying about how the amazing like the technology was mm -hmm. in uh, some science fiction films. Like, I think you mentioned Jurassic Park. Yeah, well, Jurassic Park was a beginning for dinosaurs. Before mm -hmm. then, it was the little plastic creatures. <laughs> yeah. They were using um, lizards and basically blowing the pictures up. Yeah. I, yeah. But my question is, um, Graham Turner uh, stated in his book Films as Social Practice that genres continually change, modulate and redefine themselves. So to what extent do you agree with that statement, but with science fiction in particular? Well, technology keeps advancing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I've said, you go from the plastic dinosaurs of uh, way back when um, to the to the lizards that got blown up. Yeah. You can see just how much it's progressed. I mean, even if you take Jurassic Park and you take Jurassic World, you can see how much that technology yeah. has progressed within such a short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I feel like 
because of technological advancements, science fiction in particular has definitely changed over time. Like, mm-hmm. like you said before, there wasn't re- they they were limited with what they could do, like using real live lizards, the dinosaurs, versus um, versus now where they like use CGI, which is completely. Those are computer yeah. computer related. And they? I mean, you did get the ones where they used puppets and stuff. Obviously, but yeah. obviously, puppets depend on the maker of yeah. them. But um. You know, back in like seventies and eighties science fiction films, like Mm -hmm. I don't know, like I don't know, Star Wars maybe, you'd see a lot of like touch screens and even in the original Jurassic Park, uh, the character like she in the Jeep, she goes, Oh, it's touch screen, which is, you know, some futuristic amazing thing. (laughs) But now, if you see touch screen in a film, you're just gonna be like, Oh well we've got that on our phones. Uh, I even had a touch screen laptop at one point. Like touchscreen technology is so normal. Yeah, but do you know? We're not fascinated. If I say CD ROM to you, do you even know what it is? Something to do with computers. <laughs> it is something to do with computers. CD ROM. That's not talked about these days, is it? In in confines of computer technology talk. No. You know, our technology has advanced that much. I mean, I mean, that's that's going from thing. trekkies and the beaming up and transport teleportation. We haven't actually got there yet. Yeah. But do you know? We have sent ships to the moon and all sorts. Ever since those came out in the 50s and 60s, it's amazing just how far technology has come. That's another thing. When you mentioned, like, do I know what CD-ROM is, but it's mentioned in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like science fiction in particular does rely on a level of, like, technological understanding. So, like, I mean, obviously I'm going to know that CD-ROM is to do with computers, but, like, what about someone who's, like, 90 years old? Are they going to know what that is? Um, when they first watched Jurassic Park, and even now, like, is an eighty-year-old person going to know what I mean if I say I'm going to upload it to the cloud? Are they going to know what I mean by that? And maybe not, maybe not. But you know, technology advances so fast, and I think these people know that these days. You know, even even grandparents have to know. They might not be up with technology, but they do know that technology is so advanced. But even they can't keep up with it. Yeah, even I can't keep up with it sometimes. Yeah, but so. with science fiction in particular, I feel like that's the one that uses like the most technological language because, well, it's science fiction. There's all these spaceships and like you see people using like not even touch screens anymore, but like holograms to touch. Um, but also, what I wanted to get around to was fans as not just as consumers, but as uh, like participating in the fan culture, I guess where they are producers themselves and creators and critics of the content that they subscribe to. So mm-hmm. an example that I know very well would be Jurassic Park. There's multiple fan-made films for the Jurassic Park franchise. Um, and also a, a good example of participatory culture in Jurassic Park would be after the first film, these two guys made a website based on it and they did such a good job of designing that website and putting it together that people really thought it was an official website that was that people were hired to make but it wasn't it was just made by two random guys oh, but wow. when when Jurassic World came around uh the producers actually asked these two guys and they paid them money to design an official website for them and it just kind of proves that, you know... Sometimes fans get noticed. Yeah, they do. And they get paid to be a part of the franchise. And it's just like this... Well, people write stories, fantastical stories, you know... Fan fiction. Fan fictions, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and fan art as well. Yeah. And even, we mentioned earlier, cosplayers, that's like a form of, you know, creating, because they're creating outfits. And some people even change up the outfits. Um so, I mean, you, I don't, I haven't seen this, but you could see, like, a person wearing, like, a Darth Vader mask and a black dress to make, like, a Darth Vader female version. It's not even just changing it to be, like, a female version of that character, but there are also people who change the character's outfits to make them as if they lived in a different universe. Like, you could have, like, a, a yeah. version of Darth Vader where he's a baker, you know? Like, that's the <laughs> yeah. thing. That's the thing that people do. And not, I haven't really seen that in cosplaying, but I've seen it in fan art. Not, not well, particularly. Duffy if they can do fan but... art, they can probably make it. Yeah, but that's that's the thing that people do. They like to switch universes. Um, yeah, with... which brings out other people's imaginations. And I've seen uh, crossovers between Jurassic World and Guardians of the Galaxy because mm-hmm. Chris Pratt is an actor in both of those films, and 
Yeah. I think I think it's in Guardians of the Galaxy. He like says something about getting raptors to defend the universe or something, which is just. I mean, with him having acted in um, Jurassic World, it's like who isn't going to make a crossover between Guardians of the Galaxy and Jurassic World? As I think that might be fiction. the final Marvel film. Actually, he says that in. But um, you know, there's two different science fiction films there. People yeah. are making crossovers where there's like raptors with. Star Lord, which is his character's name in Guardians of the Galaxy. I would be surprised if they made a Star Lord outfit with a raptor's head on top. Yeah, people, that's probably been done because there's just so many different things that have been created from mm-hmm. random films. Um, and I feel like I, I said this before, but science fiction is like so popular that there's so much to create. Well, you within can use it. your imagination on it. So we've pretty much discussed everything and that pretty much concludes our discussion today about science fiction and the relationship between audience and film. Yeah.